This is the last photo I took of her, right before she left her final breath on the vet's table, on July 28, 2021, at 14.35. Scrolling through the millions of footage I have of her, I've been collecting in my head tons of last photos. This is her last photo on a beach. This is her last photo on an island, on a boat. This is her last photo in the car. This is the last time we all traveled together. This is her last photo in my hometown, sniffing frantically in the ship territory. This is her last group photo. This is her last Christmas photo. This Christmas she won't be around and I didn't put up a tree this year because I just don't feel like it. This is the last photo of her in my arms. I wish she had died there, in my arms. I always pictured her leaving her final breath at home with me while I'm holding her, but death never comes the way you plan it. Never. She died among strangers with me holding her paw and whispering in her ear, pretending that it was just the two of us. I have a hard time mourning in company. I always mourn alone, so I left the clinic acting all composed and calm. I cried in the car on the way back. I had cried a million times for her over the past months that she was dealing with the effects of her old age. This time it was different. When you cry because they are sick, you cry because of fear. The fear of the unknown. Fear of what's coming. Fear of loss. You cry because you want to turn back time. Not the time right before they got sick so that your chances of curing them increase, but the time way back. Back in the beginning. In a way, you wish time starts counting in a reverse, that today is preceded by yesterday, that yesterday is preceded by the day before yesterday, that this year is preceded by the year before. But after she was gone, I cried only for my loneliness. For the part of me that was missing, and that I was never going to get it back. For the new me, crippled from now on. My mutilated self. Guilt is always a part of grief. Guilt for the decisions I made for her, or didn't. Did I try too hard to keep her going? Did I not try hard enough? Were the last six months of her life worth it? Were they not? Did I miss any signs? Had I not missed any signs, had I made different decisions, would there have been a different outcome? I did naively believe that she was going to live forever. Not out of stupidity, but out of a feeling of self-preservation, in a way. It's the same feeling that makes you think you'll never grow old. Silly things enforced my belief that she could never die, like the fact that this corner between the window and the fireplace is the corner where her bed is, and that corner cannot exist within the apartment's architecture without her bed decorating it and her in it. Small things like that naively make you unable to comprehend an everyday life where this animal is not here. Her football, her colors, her name tag. The new bed I got for her when she had her first major health crisis back in January. Beds last about two years with her digging and abusing them, so for the next two years she needed to be here because there's the new bed that has a two-year lifespan. And those little material things are the ones that make the absence harder. They are the there, in the house, while she isn't. There's her bowl. It has to be filled with food. There's the bed. It has to be slept on. There's her leash. Hanging by the door, she needs to put it on so we can go for a walk. I don't know what a day in my life is supposed to be like if it doesn't include her walk. The day after she was hospitalized for the last time, I washed all her bedding and I put it back in its place so that she would come back to a clean bed and make yet another fresh start. <sighs> My precious, she was so fresh, so well taken care of. 
but she never came back. And for days I would look at that clean bed wishing I had never washed it. I spent endless hours looking for her smell in other places that hadn't been cleaned. I had the collar she was wearing when she passed, the same collar she had on on my wedding day, but that smelled of hospital and I wanted to find her smell. Eventually I found one of her winter blankets from last year that I hadn't washed and I dived into that blanket and that smell and slept with it and I've been sleeping with it for months now. Some nights that her absence physically hurts so much that I need to squeeze something unbreakable until I fall asleep. The cremation process was for me traumatizing. But I suppose any process dealing with the body of a loved one is traumatizing. Because although you know that who you loved is not in there anymore, in a way, they are. Because you did love the body. You cared for it. You had it living with you, breathing and existing for years. And you mourn its loss. You don't want to let it go. You don't want to let go of the physical presence. It's the only tangible evidence of life that makes sense. It's her physical presence I've been missing all those months anyway. Everything that her body was, its smell, its feel, its sounds and its warmth. I would give everything to just turn my head just once and see her sleeping in that corner again, just one last time. Some of her stuff are still around where they used to be. Her leash hanging by the door, ready to be used. Her bowl together with the other two, ready to be filled with food. And some of her other stuff is in a box by my bed, next to that blanket that still has her smell and some photos of her hanging on the wall above. It's a relief having them there. Sometimes, sometimes they make the absence so evident that they hurt. For the first couple of weeks after her death, I did nothing. I mechanically lived, ate, cared for the other animals and just existed without her, doing as little as possible. As if I was trying to cautiously observe how life would be from now on. And I avoided everyone. I refused to talk about her, even with friends who tried. I didn't need other people's words tainting my perception of what her absence really meant to me. It was my loss, only mine, my dog, mine. Life got in the way eventually. The country burned to the ground that summer. We had to evacuate the shelter and for about a week I worked non-stop. Suddenly, I went from doing nothing and seeing no one to being surrounded by animals and people. Ashes filled the city sky to the point where they would cover our cars and our hair and we would inhale them every day. It was a doomsday scenery, matching my mood. The fires got me back on track in a way. Days went by, weeks, months, life went on. I avoided thinking about her and talking about her. Everyone who would ask how I was coping, I would answer that I think I'm in denial. Until today, I tell people that I have three dogs and three cats, and if they wonder how come they don't see the third dog around, I reply that she's old, or that she's sick, or that she's somewhere else. She's somewhere else. She is also here. There's no clever way to explain that she is still here, in a way. It's like she's not in frame, but she's around. The first time of doing everything without counting her in was the hardest. The first time I walked my dogs, my two remaining dogs. The first time I fed them leaving the third bowl on the shelf. The first time we traveled again with the car seat next to me empty. The first time the doorbell rang and she didn't jump off to go to the front door. The first time this friend visited without her being there to greet her. The first time that other friend visited. 
The first time I went into the house without her waiting for me. The first time I went to bed and didn't hear her footsteps coming in the bedroom. The first time I cried for her and I had no one to hold but that blanket that still has her smell. I can go on forever. I can talk about how I refuse to pack anything that is hers, how I watch the dogs and the cats use her now empty bed, and I feel like removing them from there as if she's going to come back at any moment to sleep on it. But in a way, I let them use what's hers because she would let them use it. She was a giver in her own way, accepting everything and everyone. After she died, I thought that in her memory, I would try to change my attitude towards things, to be better, like she was, more accepting, more relaxed. I didn't. I'm me. I try to keep the balance in my life by pretending that she's still around. She was the first animal that stepped foot in this apartment and she set the rules for everyone else that came next. Those were great rules. I'm afraid I won't be able to keep it up without her. I'm afraid that we'll get lost in chaos. That we won't be able to function as a group with her missing. There is nothing complicated about the loss of a pet dog. Nothing at all. The feeling is as simple as it is profound. It is pure loss. With people it is complicated because human relationships are complicated. We mourn the words left unspoken. We mourn the small or big secrets we never shared. We mourn the life they lived or didn't, their suffering and the way they coped with that suffering. Loss is tainted by small or big misunderstandings and disagreements and arguments and difference of opinions and expectations never met. Our humans pass and we are left behind trying to cope with remembering them for who they really were, with all their flaws. None of that is there when it comes to animals. They are perfect. The relationship is perfect in its simplicity, is pure love. And when they pass, we are only left to mourn the loss of that pure love and their physical presence. I miss her. The house misses her. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side, our fears are done. I had planned for even more things to say. This would be a tribute of some sort, a tribute to her, to us. But the more stuff I write, the more stuff I decide to keep to myself. I have no idea how to end this video. Maybe I shouldn't end it. There is no end that comes with death. No final words that give closure. Maybe that's why I don't want to put out there every single detail about her and close her book of life. Death is not the end of something nor the beginning of something, it's just... a point in time. Well, for me. This extreme fear of death we have, the fear of the unknown, narrows our relationships, trying to squeeze them within the time of someone living. But a relationship continues even after one of the two has passed away. It changes, but it doesn't go away. It never goes away, no matter how many years have passed. And like every relationship that grows, it brings up new feelings and new thoughts for years to come, all the way until the one remaining passes away too. So this was all I had to say about her now. These are my feelings up until this point. They will change over time. They will evolve. 
and they will keep evolving for as long as I live and remember. And so will my relationship with her. <laughs>